Well, glory to Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is truly risen. And we're on our Thursday UCAST. Today, next Thursday will be Ascension Thursday, so we'll probably have something a little different. And we're on number 49. We can say the glory be to the Father, and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So we're on question 49 in the Youth Catechism about Divine Providence, which isn't the capital of Rhode Island. It's the care that God has for us, the goodwill God has for us. Does God guide the world and my life? Yes, but in a mysterious way. God guides everything along paths that only he knows, leading to its perfection. At no point in time does something that he has created fall out of his hands. So Jesus said, uh, nothing can be snatched out of my hands. But it doesn't mean that we can't leave Jesus. We can't leave communion with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have that freedom to do that. And that, this all involves the mystery of love, because love has to be freely given and freely received. It can't be forced on someone. It's like grace, grace, which means gift, charis. It can't be forced on someone. It's not irresistible. We can resist. That's part of the mystery of, of love. That's part of the mystery of being human and also of relating to God in a relationship of love, rather than simply in a relationship of force. As Jesus says, I call you fr not slaves, but friends. And so, you know, a friend can't be forced into something. That's not friendship. So, we're in a mis this guidance of God, and it's this, the use case, it's, it's a mysterious thing, but mysterious, not in the sense of it's a problem that has to be explained somewhere, some gap that has to be filled, but rather as this wonder that can be experienced and, and the reality of paradox. Paradox isn't uh, a couple of birds. Paradox is not contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction, but it's not a real contradiction. It may look like that on the surface, but it isn't. And life is filled with it. Science, the physical sciences are filled with paradox. Everything is filled with paradoxes. And especially our relationship with God. Because God is right off at our experience as Christians, a paradox. God is absolutely one, yet he is truly three. He is this total unity, yet he is this total community. <clears throat> God is love, that's his very nature, yet God is just. God is righteous, totally righteous, totally holy, yet he can make us righteous and holy by giving us his, his nature, his very righteousness, his, his holiness. God, the Word, Jesus, is Jesus, and Jesus is fully and truly God, but he's fully and truly human, and yet he's one person, one united. He's united, yet distinct, reflecting the sense of the Trinity, united and distinct. The, the Trinity is distinct in person, and one in nature, one in essence, and all that, and Jesus is one person, yet he's two distinct natures, not like the Trinity, one nature and three persons, but one person and two natures. And so these are paradoxes, they're not contradictions. 
and God's providence can be a paradox. It's a paradox. His care for us, yet he doesn't force us. We're not uh, under constraints. When I was a child, my mother had these this harness thing, which I still remember, which I remember actually with affection. Sort of, and it was a leash. It was like a dog thing. Now they would consider that, I suppose, somehow a dehumanizing or something, but it was perfect for me because my mother could just pull the thing if she took me out for a walk, so to speak. I could, I was in this harness and I wouldn't wander off into the, into the street. She could control me. And uh, God doesn't do that to us. God's providential care is not uh, like that. It's not holding us on a leash. We are cared for by God, by the power of his grace. So there's this mystery, this paradox of freedom, yet God's care for us. God influences, at no point in time does God, does something that God has created fall out of his hands. So uh, there's this, some people try to resolve this by abolishing freedom or by abolishing what we would see as, as God's love, what people outside of that theological system would see as God's love. And they would say, oh, because God doesn't love everybody. They'd say God only loves the, the few that he predetermined from all time. And just don't question this and just go along with it. Now, in, as Catholics, we believe in predestination, but we do not believe in predeterminism. We don't have what they call double predestination. We believe God has destined us for union with him, but he's not going to force us. He's giving us all the means of experiencing his providence, all the means of experiencing the reality of grace, all the means of getting to that point of union with God without an obstruction. But he's not going to force us. As Jesus says, I come to the door and I knock in Revelation 3. He doesn't say, I come to the door and I bash it in. God influences both the great events of history and also the little events of our personal life without reducing our freedom or making us mere marionettes in his eternal plan. So, of course, if there's no real freedom of the will, if there's irresistible grace and God's will is just irresistible, then that's what we would be. We would be puppets that he would be moving around. It would also, re f at least functionally, make God the author, the sustainer, and the finisher, the completer of evil. So uh, this, of course, this is in some ways a caricature of uh, that particular type of theology, that, uh, that form of fatalism. Uh, and there are nuances in that, which I'm not going into, but I could never figure it out. I literally found it in, incredible, just unbelievable, that it's just, it has, it's just, that, that God is, as, as John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says, uh, your God is my devil, if that's, that's the case. But God isn't. God is truly providential. And his providential care is universal. And in this, there's still that mystery of freedom. God influences both the great events of history and also the little events of our personal life. So the great events, the movers and shakers, can cooperate with God's grace or not. And if you look at the violence, the nastiness, the cruelty, the selfishness of, that's often done in history by people with power, your mass murder and all the stuff in, for the purpose of, of quote unquote glory and, and other things, they doing anything for power. Uh, it, it doesn't seem very much cooperation with grace, but there are, that does happen. God comes in, God will use what he can without, by, and by can, I mean what he can do according to his nature as love and according to our nature of being free beings. Conditioned, we are, we're fallen, our freedom is uh, 
lopsided and tends to fall into license or, or in self-destruction. But God is there with his grace, his providential care, there to heal us, there to bring us out, there to call us out of this and give us the means of being healed spiritually and in other ways. So, uh, so uh, we believe in a God who enters into history. He, he's not a, a cyclic God outside of history merely. No, he's a God who's come into history. He's a God who made history. He's a God who uh, brought creation. He's the God uh, who's beyond all time, but he's the God of time. He's the God of created time and space and all that and materiality. And he shows this in the, the deepest way by coming in and taking on preacherhood himself, becoming fully human, having a body, having a materiality, having an image that, you know, if he if they had photography around them, they could have taken pictures of them. They, uh, the, uh, uh, there's no description of Jesus in, in, the, in the Gospels or anything. He does, doesn't say what he looks like. And the people have always been interested in that. And of course, there's the the issue of the Shroud of Turin is this actually a portrait of Jesus? It's a lot. There's a lot of evidence towards it, but then the uh, carbon dating it didn't turn out. But it seems well where they took it from, it was it was flawed. But anyway, uh, I like actually Jesus represented in all ways. If he looks German, if he looks. Uh, Northern Chinese, if he looks Vietnamese, if he looks Indonesian, if he looks uh, South African, if he looks East African, West African, North African. So uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, Inuit, all that, and, and even dressed up like that. I like that the Madonna and Child, I really like those that have them as other as, uh, people that look like the other people. Just like when Mary appears, she tends to appear in, uh, to look like the people that she's appearing to, it seems, in Guadalupe and these other places. Well, Jesus is God fully entered into history, true God and true man. And there's a line in the Creed, the, in both the Nicene and the Apostles, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's a, a historical situation. Jesus came not only with a particular DNA, but he came at a particular time, at a particular place, in a particular culture, in a particular this, a particular that. Unique everything, just as all of us are unique in our way. So, and, so he's in some ways a product of his time, yet also he calls his time to conversion. He calls his, his time to transformation. He, call, he shocks people by... Uh, doing things against the customs that they had at times. So, but also in the little things, what someone calls, you know, the things that seem coincidences that God, God uses, and uh, this person calls them God incidences, that, that God uses all this stuff. And also things that are used against us, God will use that for our salvation. Even uh, in, the, in the situation of martyrs, they are torture and murder, which is evil. And God uses that salvifically for them. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that he plans this out and say, you know, all eternity said, well, you know, I, that'll make my day if this servant of mine is tortured to death. No, God isn't like that. But God will use everything that we put in his hands, that we permit him to use. So even the sins of others. The only thing he cannot use is our unrepentant sin. Our repentant sin, yes. Unrepentant sin, no. Again, that's part of the mystery of freedom, the mystery of love, and the mystery of God being God who is limitless and infinite and eternal quote-unquote, limited by his nature, by his being love. 
And it's not a limitation, it's actually the freedom. If, if he were, if he did not have love as, his, as, the, as the nature and as the condition for everything, he would be limited, he would be very flawed. And some people say that if when they take a literal and superficial reading of much of the scriptures, the God uh, comes off not just as flawed, as, as monstrous. And uh, 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 a horror, really. But that's a superficial reading. And, you know, often the same things that'll say that God is, is vindictive down to so much generation, it'll say that he is slow to anger and rich in kindness. And so, and that he, he forgives and all of these. All that's there, uh, but sometimes we have to sift. And what's the sieve that we use to sift this? God is love, that phrase, God is love. And as Christians, Jesus is Lord. Those two phrases are uh, uh, crucial to any reading of scripture as a Christian. Any reading of scripture in, in the light of the Holy Spirit in prayer. So we, it's a, it, this belief in God's providence involves trust in him, that we trust him, that, that no matter what happens, God is there. God will use what we permit him to use in the mystery of our freedom and in the mystery of his infinite freedom. And so the little events, we just ask the Lord to use that Again, it's not, you know, the, that he's manipulating all of these little things. And it's not that we should live in carelessness. We should be quite careful. So, you know, in in a, the pandemic here, we really need to be really careful. And it's not being trusting in God to say, well, I'm covered by grace. I have the promises of, of this. So I can, you know, we can all gather together 10,000 people in this room, as long as we're praising God about it, then we don't have to wear masks or anything, because that'll be uh, a sign of our faith in God. No, that's foolhardiness. And uh, we shouldn't accept God to bless that. To that, you know, we, we shouldn't, uh, as they say, tempt the fates. We shouldn't uh, contradict nature, the laws of nature. There's some people who say, Oh, uh, well, God has given us the world so we can do anything we want to it, and God will, you know, miraculously heal it. Well, you know, if we throw all this back in his face, we throw our stewardship back in his face, don't expect him to be, uh, to correct our willed wrongs and our selfishness. We, what we need is true repentance and responsibility in our actions. Grace does not remove responsibility. Actually, it intensifies responsibility because it intensifies love. Love intensifies a sense of responsibility for another. In God, we live and move and have our being from Acts 17, 28, which may be quoting from a Greek philosopher at the time, or, or, or before even, God is in everything we meet, and all the changes of our life, even in the painful events and the seemingly meaningless coincidences. So in growing in gratitude, we ask the Lord to grow, approach everything in gratitude, even the painful things that he, he's going to use this. And it doesn't mean that we should be passive in the light of, of personal injustices or pain or any of that. We need to deal with that. So if, if, a, if a, a cross can be corrected, then it isn't the cross that God wants us to bear. You know, if, uh, uh, you know people who torture themselves intentionally and all this 
and go out of their way for that. That's not the, the will of God. That's that sickness. That's not uh, virtue. God wants to write straight even with the crooked lines of our life. What he takes away from us and what he gives us, the ways in which he strengthens us and the ways in which he tests us, all these are arrangements and signs of his will. So it really bothers me when people say God took so-and-so. You know, God took the mother of this two-year-old. Like that, that's, uh, and you can say that that's that's biblical language, but it's. Uh, but for me, when I, mean, I look at Jesus, Jesus' Sacred Heart is the first heart to break in any of our griefs, not the the puppet master in this, or not the one to say, "Oh, well, I'll do this. I'll just pull this person out," because I feel like it, and then. And if uh, this child is deprived of mother and all the grief and the, that and the sorrow, all these people, well, that's just the way it is. Well, I don't think that's the approach. The, our approach should be, God, you're going to use this. And I know uh, that Jesus bore all this grief on the cross and that it, this is not uh, an alien thing. But God will use this. God integrates this into his plan. And according to our receptivity, according to our yielding to God, our trusting in his providence. Like the uh, prayer of, uh, the prayer of abandonment of Saint Ch Blessed Child de Foucault, Charles de Foucault. Like, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. And then, and he says, uh, I'm prepared for all. And so, you know, I, I, am I prepared for all? I have to think of that. Am I prepared for this? So I, I, I need to grow more and more in prayer and saying, may I be ready with every situation, not to respond in hatred, not to respond in uh, mistrust of you, but to respond in love, to respond in faith, to respond in hope. All of these are arrangements and signs of his will. So it's a, you have this testing, uh, testing of us, though. But, but it's uh, testing more in the image of a, uh, you know, testing a car out, not, you know, testing us to see if we're going to fall or uh, heating up a metal so that it can be purified more that I find that image uh, greater than more of something like that God is uh, out there to torment us and often people uh, see when how far we can he can push us until we break that's like you know the when people bring up the story of Abraham and Isaac and try to say well that was a, a good thing that that with that 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 was uh, and on a superficial level, it is monstrous. That's all it is. But God is love, and Jesus is Lord. So when we look at that story, the, the reality of that, of how God is actually calling people out from that uh, pagan mindset of God as uh, a cruel being who needs to be sustained by uh, human blood, sort of this the this sort of cosmic vampire, uh, yeah, rather than the God who is the other way around, the God who takes our nature on himself, our flesh and blood, and pours that blood out. It's his own blood that he's taken, who knows our pain, who goes through our pain. So we see in the Abraham and Isaac story the pre foreshadowing of Christ with. Isaac carrying the wood, Jesus carrying the cross. God providing the ram, uh, which is Jesus. God himself uh, comes to that. God himself provides the sacrifice, which is God.
about himself, become fully human. Question 50. What role does man play in God's providence? Mother Teresa uh, said this about providence. Trust in divine providence is the firm, lively faith that God can and will help us. It is obvious that he can help since he is all-powerful. It is certain that he will help us because he promised it in many passages of sacred scripture and keeps all his promises faithfully. So the, the act of faith, because if I believe that you're really going to be the person you promised to be, and not just abstractly, but in the concrete in my life. But what role does man play in God's providence? The completion of creation through divine providence is not something that happens above and beyond us. God invites us to collaborate in the completion of creation, in the stewardship of creation. So we're not just some cog in this uh, giant grandfather clock that God has put together and wound up and he's going off now. I say, oh, well, I'm going off to, you know, play golf or something in, in Edinburgh. No, uh, uh, and you just tend to yourself and I'll come at the end and see how it all work, worked out and, and uh, if you've tested well in this and gone through this and then... I'll reward you. No, God is there with us in the midst of all of this. And God calls us to be fellow workers with him, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. That we're not uh, outside. Now, that brings us the paradox of grace and freedom, of, uh, God, of grace being everything, God's grace affecting everything, uh, everything being a gift, and then we're called to be fellow workers with God, to be stewards, stewards of what we have. A paradox, but not a contradiction, and viewed in the mystery of love. Man can reject God's will. He does better, though, to become an instrument of God's love. Mother Teresa, during her lifetime, strove to think in this way. I am only a little pencil in the hand of our Lord. He may cut or sharpen the pencil. He may write or draw whatever or whenever he wants. If the writing or drawing is good, we do not honor the pencil or the material that is used, but rather the one who used it. I thought that was Therese of Lisieux, but I guess it's, it's Teresa of Calcutta. Although God's work, God works with us and through us also, nevertheless, we must never mistake our own thinking, planning, and doing for the working of God. God does not need our work as though he would lack something without it. God will not act without us when it comes to our salvation, etc. You know, infant baptism is another story, but, and uh, often the initial initial thrust of grace but god is not going to keep us out of the picture he's not going to save us in spite of ourselves he's going to save us and he's the one doing the saving not not me i'm not saving myself i'm not building this up through force of will and and uh, innate character no, I'm relying on God's grace. I'm cooperating with God's grace. I'm struggling in God's grace and sometimes even with God's grace. But it's grace beginning, sustaining, and fulfilling. That very energy of God. If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, why does he not prevent evil? That's the big question of, of God. If God is all is love and God is all good and God is all wise, 
and he's all powerful and all knowing and omnipresent everywhere, how is it that evil can exist? Now, moral evil, we can see how that can exist with the mystery of freedom. So we can just say, no, I'm going to just do this and, and go against that and how that affects others. But why doesn't God miraculously intervene all the time? Why isn't there a constant opening of the Red Seas in the world? Why isn't there constant a miraculous intervention of God? In this, especially with the with, with innocent, with or little children and, and all that. Why doesn't God come and strike down all the uh, wicked oppressors, the pharaohs uh, of our age? Why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he do that? Why does he let his own suffer and die and with martyrs and, and other things like that? But as I mentioned before, this is a participation in the saving uh, death and death of Christ, and the we become channels, channels of that, channels of that the merits of Jesus' death in our struggles, in our pains, and all that. So the great answer, Christian answer to the problem of pain, is the crucifix. With Jesus dead or dying depicted on the cross, that Saint Paul talks about, uh, you know, that he was depicted before you, crucified. And so that's that's the answer, but it's not an easy answer, and it's not an answer that puts every everything in its little place and ties a bow on it. It's the answer that involves struggle. It's answer, take up your cross and follow me. And it's not an answer that we like. But what's at the other end? The resurrection. What was the end at the end of Jesus' crucifixion? His resurrection. The end of ours is our resurrection, our bodily resurrection. Yet even before that, may we be completely transformed uh, when we leave this body. And, and cooperate with his grace. Cooperation is such a crucial word in our theology, in Catholic and Orthodox theology. God allows evil only so to make something better result from it. And that sounds like a, a you know, a hallmark card sort of thing. It's just, it seems trite, and especially in the face of real suffering and pain. But when we look at that, we look at that. This is from St. Thomas Aquinas. When we really look at it in the, in, the, in the eyes of faith, through the eyes of hope, through the eyes of love, then we say, yes, Lord, I trust you. You're going to use this no matter what it is. Just as you use the greatest crime of, of, of killing God incarnate, how, yet you use that not as the means of destruction. It seemed like a victory of evil, but it wasn't. By death, death is slain. By your death, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by his death and bestowing life on those in the grave. So death is not the victor. Sin is not the victor. The pain is not the victor. Love is the victor. Grace is the victor. God, who is love, infinite eternal love, that infinite eternal community of love, the, the, ab the absolute oneness of love. Can... God is the victor. Death is not the victor. Sin is not the victor. All of these things are not the victor. But it takes faith in the midst of that. It takes hope in the midst of that. It takes love in the midst of this to see that in, in the suffering that we're going. So this, this hope that we have, the Christian hope, is not some sort of uh, whistle by the graveyard optimism, uh, unrealistic. No, ours, we believe it's totally realistic. We face the reality of death and pain. 
we face that, but we look beyond to God. And the, uh, and the radical materialists would say, oh, that's not realism at all. But we'd say, oh, this is the really real. This is the victorious reality. So God allows evil only so as to make something better result from it, St. Thomas Aquinas. Evil in the world is an obscure and painful mystery. And if someone says, well, I have the, the I put it together all the whole uh, thing of evil and good and all, and it all fits together. Uh, I would be a little doubt, a little skeptical of that, because in a sense, yes, it all does fit together in the cross, in the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. But in the reality of grappling with this, and it's it is painful. And then there are some people who try to make it simple by just taking love out of the equation altogether and basically just making God power. And so, you know, and, you know, he'll, he'll be good to his own in the end, whoever they are. But I think that, that uh, takes, takes God out of God. The, uh, all that's left is this uh, be, power being who isn't even uh, as good as most of the villains in the stories. No, God is good. God is love with a capital L. God is the one who triumphs. God is the all just one as well. Mercy and justice together. Again, that paradox in the reality of God. Even the, even the crucified asked his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Yes, he was quoting a psalm, a messianic psalm that he was fulfilling, but I'm convinced he really felt that, he really meant that. He really took all that on himself. He felt totally alienated from God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and even from his very person, his, his own God reality. He, he was felt alienated from that in his humanity, in this pre-resurrection humanity, taking on himself all of our depression, all of our fears, all of our anxiety, all of these things there on the cross, the altar of the cross. And it, it just didn't begin at the cross. It began with his life, the earliest part of his life. You know, right from the beginning, he had to flee for his life. He had to be uprooted. He had. To, he knew the the struggle of being human and being a poor human at a time with that and situation in which they didn't have conveniences that most of us Westerners have, and all of that that he went through. He went through this out of love for us. But the cross is not the end. The empty tomb is the end. The resurrection is the end. Jesus and Jesus ascended into heaven. But still, the cross is central. It's, we live in the theology of the cross, in the incarnation and in his saving death, and also in his resurrection. The resurrection, the vindication of the, the cross. The, uh, the, the union of the whole Christ event in the sacrifice, the, the saving incarnation, death and resurrection of Christ, and his intercession for us in heaven, his perpetual presenting us to the Father, per perpetually presenting himself as the sacrifice and as the, the vindication before the Father. And he will come again in glory. That also. These we remember in the divine liturgy, in the Mass. And not just remember them as a, you know, isn't that, you know, nice when that happened, or won't that be nice when this does happen? But 
the sacramental experience of that right now. The inexhaustible sacrifice of Christ. Now, if not repeated, that's a slander against Catholics and Orthodox that we believe and teach that Jesus is killed over and over again at Mass, so the divine liturgy. That it's that's not true. That's uh, it's it, 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 whoever's precisely it just isn't getting the reality of of what real presence means. It's not repetition. It's uh, present. The power, not just in virtute, in power, but in reality, present. Much about the mystery, this the mystery of evil and the mystery of everything, is incomprehensible. One thing, though, we know for sure, God is 100% good. He can never be the originator of something evil. God created the world to be good, but it is not yet complete. In violent upheavals and painful processes, it is being shaped and moved to this final perfection. So... You know, you look at a volcanic eruption and stuff that's destructive, but it's creative as well. And all that, and even the reality of change and decay and death is creative. Even in, in the physical world, uh, in, in the biological sphere. But even more so in the spiritual sphere, because death in Christ has become the gate of life, life eternal. There is what is called physical evil, for example, a birth defect or a natural catastrophe. And these remain puzzling with respect to God's goodness. Because as I said, the moral evil, okay, but, but then this, you know, that, uh, you know, why is this happening? Why, you know, why? Why does, you know, a hurricane come and strike uh, poor, good people and this stuff, but then the, uh, the powerful and the, the wicked seem to get away with it? You know, and you look at, uh, let's say, North Korea and the, the, uh, well, the people there are so oppressed and starved and all that. And the people on the top seem to live very, very uh, luxuriously. In the face of that. And why doesn't God come in, roll up his sleeves, and whack them? Why does he come in and do, you know, uh, say, okay, this is it. I've had it. You know, like my father said, don't make me come up there. We would be upstairs. We were supposed to be asleep. We would be running back and forth. But my father said that. But if you, especially if you heard the creaking on the steps as he was coming up, you're just going to, that was that. You knew that that was something. Well, you know, when I was a child, I said, well, why doesn't God do that? Why doesn't God just come down and, and do things? And the more and more I came, I remember receiving this crucifix. And I have, I have the same version, but it had a stand up before. It doesn't have the you know, it's a little wooden crucifix, or actually it was molded. And then to see and, and Christ and that, and uh, as a child, I was thinking how much this this meant. And we would have stations of the cross. We'd be marched over every Friday of Lent over to that. And I believe it was a child's adaptation of Alphonse Saint Alphonse de Gori thing. And one line really hit me. One time is this: that if I were the only one, that Jesus would have gone through all this. Also, if I were the only one who needed to, he would have done all this. And that really hit me. That, that, that that's how much God loves us. That, that this is it. That this, this death on the cross really means something. And that there is vindication that this will be uh, a transformation. This really will happen. So that physical evil, which is... It still is, is in some ways more difficult to deal with the moral evil. We have that, and then moral evil. Moral evil, in contrast, come about through the misuse of freedom in the world, hell on earth, 
child soldiers, suicide bombings, concentration camps. Hell on earth is usually man-made. The decisive question is, therefore, not how can anyone believe in a good God when there is so much evil, but rather how could a person with a heart and understanding endure life in this world if God did not exist? So uh, there are those who say this is an argument against the existence of God. But we would say, well, this is an argument for the existence of God, for God. Th this God must be. Otherwise, this, this uh, the, the evil is victorious. Or rather, it makes no sense. It's as Shakespeare said, a tale, life is a tale told by an idiot. It is no, it's it's ultimately purposeless. And you know, if we try to existentially claw purpose out of this somehow or other, it, 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 uh, that's all gonna be shattered anyway. So uh the the mystery of evil would be demands God as an answer, the all good, the uh, all transforming God, the God who will wipe away every tear. Christ's death and resurrection show us that evil did not have the first word, nor does it have the last. God made absolute good result from the worst evil. We believe that in the last judgment, God will put an end to all injustice. In the life of the world to come, evil no longer has any place and suffering ends. So it's not this, you know, eternal, uh, everlasting, downward spiral, and then you know, it gets to the bottom, and then there's a spiral that goes up, and then it starts again and goes down, and then that's the way it is, always like that. No, we believe that this ends. Evil ends. Evil which is ultimately the absence of good, is healed and banished. Those who freely choose evil uh, as their permanent choice, that they're free to live in that, but they will be quarantined. It's, and it won't be for 40 days either. That's their choice. It, it, it is an irony, in a sense, a paradox, that that's the mercy of God. Of the, they're quarantining them from everybody else. Not just a mercy to the those who are not in this reality, but in a sense a mercy to them. Because the torment of the light of God will be so much greater. And then this is their will. This is what you choose. This is what you want. You say, how can anyone want hell? Well, we're not talking about the results, the direct results of hell, which they don't want, but that come along with it. But uh, the the path of hell, that they, they've they chosen that. That's uh, the way they want it. So may we not be with that. May we pray and to pray that that prayer and the, the rosary, the Fatima prayer, uh, that uh, for the mercy of God on everybody, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of your mercy. We believe that in the last judgment, God will put an end to all injustice. So it's it's God isn't going to just you know wave his hand and uh, pretend he's not he doesn't notice the injustices. So it, there's no uh, get out of hell free card without repentance. You know if I know that something is profoundly evil, and I go with it with my full consent of the will and my knowledge of this, and, and the matter itself is evil, then all the so-called faith and uh, religious experience and, and uh, doublespeak, biblistic doublespeak I want to throw out, will avail nothing. 
In fact, it'll be worse. Far worse for those who know better than those who don't. God will put an end to all injustice. In the life of the world to come, evil no longer has any place and suffering ends. So we come to heaven and heavenly creatures. Question 52. What is heaven? Well, often we think of heaven as some sort of place, and we have this image of it, it's different in different cultures and different individuals of this, you know, paradisical place, this Nice place, trees, you know, fruit, flowers, uh, nice stuff like that. So that's that's very nice. It's a nice image. There and there will be new heavens and new earth, according to the Book of Revelation in the new creation. But heaven, that's only a minor aspect of heaven. The primary aspect of it is this unobstructed union with God. What is it? Heaven is God's milieu, milieu, place, its setting. The dwelling place of the angels and the saints. But we, can't, we cannot limit it to some sort of time-space thing. You know, not just like, it's not like this, you know, wonderful uh, park and that's that. That's uh, that imagery is wonderful, and there's there will be this you know some sort of physical reality. There's multi dimensions that we can barely conceive of uh, involved in that. But the primary thing is this union with God without obstruction. The goal of creation. So this union with God, this glory of God, is the goal of all the cosmos. That's what it's there for, to become the new heavens and the new earth. With the words heaven and earth, we designate the whole of created reality. So that's the whole of created, the, the spiritual and the physical. And then the physical, spiritual that we are. Heaven is not a place in the universe. So it's not a planet going around some sun. And then we're all there, a big enough planet for everybody to get everything he or she wants. And it's not, you know, this perpetual smorgasbord of something. But it's primarily this union with God. There's not a place in the universe. So it's not, you know, a matter. You know, did you got, you know, if you made a map of the, the universe, it wouldn't be, well, heaven's out here. And, and uh, there it is. No, everything in whence the veil is lifted, everything is heaven. Yet the placeness of heaven is everywhere in the new heavens and the new earth. It is a condition in the next life. So it's a state of being. Heaven is where God's will is done without any resistance. And no resistance at all, no emotional resistance with nothing like that, that this is the great joy of God's will. And what is God's will? That we be totally united with him. That we become filled with his nature, which is love. Heaven happens when life is present in its greatest intensity and blessedness. So even now, as citizens of heaven, we are to live in the in the in these aspects of heaven in, in the the seed form of heaven these fruits of the holy spirit the love the joy the peace the the kindness all of that the uh, what faith and hope point to because faith and once this life is over we won't need faith and hope anymore we won't need many of the virtues but we will need love because that's what it's all about. And we definitely need those virtues now. So, a kind of life that we do not find on earth. We're only in this uh, foretaste 
in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of that, when, you know, how good it is when brothers and sisters live in unity, as the psalm says. So there, there were these reflections of this, the pale reflections of the reality of heaven, of the reality of the new heavens and earth, of the new society that the church should be, the church should be this, this foreshadowing of it. But often you look at church people, and that's not often the case. Often we look at the history of the church, and people used their position to the church for exploitation. There was a hymn today on, of St. Matthias that uh, made a reference to something to the effect that, you know, even in the church, the safest, it would be the safest place, there's all of this, that Judas, Judas Iscariot, not Judah, Judas, Jude, uh, uh, defected from that, that it, the, in, within the, the bosom of the 12 apostles, to mix, mix my metaphors there, even that was there. If with God's help we arrive someday in heaven, and it's only by God's help, it's only by grace. In fact, heaven is the, the fullness of grace. With God's help we arrive someday in heaven, then waiting for us will be what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9 and so that brings us to the other alternative. What is hell? Our faith calls hell the condition of final separation from God, the absolute no to love. So Jesus, who knows what hell is like, because he knows everything, speaks about it as the outer darkness in Matthew 8.12. Expressed in our terms, it is cold rather than hot. So the imagery of fire there is, is fire is destructive, is painful. Not the fire of the crucible, which was the 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 fire of the imagery of fire of purification, but it's the destructive fire, the self-destructive fire. But cold. And it's interesting that Dante and a lot of our views of heaven and hell and stuff are more Dante than their Bible or tradition. Uh, it, it, it's Satan in the final circle there, the final center of hell there. It's, it's frozen. He's totally frozen. And uh, it, rather than hot, it's, it's frozen. And that, and that image of that. So... Uh, uh, the outer darkness. It is horrible to contemplate a condition of complete rigidity and hopeless isolation from everything that could bring aid, relief, joy, and consolation into one's life. And that, that state has willingly embraced the paradox of hell. And what are angels? Question 54. Angels are pure spiritual creatures of God who have understanding and will. They have no bodies. And in the East, they're called the bodiless powers. They cannot die because they're not, you know, they're not chemical beings that change. You know, that change is death in some way or other. Uh, they cannot change and they usually are not visible, but they can show up. They can look like anything they want. Uh, and that, the, the same is true with, with, with a body that's resurrected. Christ is the resurrected body. He wasn't recognized when he didn't want to be recognized. They live constantly in God's presence and convey God's will and God's protection to men. So they're part of this. They're part of the, the shepherding of us our guardian angels and other stuff. And they're part of our community, even though they're not bodily, bodily beings. You know, saints, usually when we talk of saints, they're human beings. When you die, you don't become an angel. That's what often people think, oh, you die, you become an angel or a devil. Uh, no, they're completely 
separate beings of reality from us. That you don't become these things. There are some religions that believe that uh, that uh, the gods and the angels and human beings and the devils and whatever, or whatever equivalents they have of those, are all one race, and then you can sort of rise or go down on, on that. But, but, but in Christianity, no. Christianity, we're all, all totally unique and always will be. And uh, we, can't, we won't become something else. We won't become an angel. We are to become fully human, uh, saints, totally sanctified, and that in the power of the, the divine life the transforming divine life, to, to be engodded, to experience uh, the fancy Greek word for that is theosis, this the state of being uh, filled with God and transformed by God in, in to total union with God. They live constantly in God's presence and convey God's will and God's protection to men. So the word angel, angelos, uh, angelus, means a messenger. So we see that in scripture. Take Gabriel, for example. So he's bringing the message, he brings the message of the incarnation to Mary, the, the offer, you know, do you want to say yes to God in this? Do you want to be this tool uh, on this in salvation here uh, by uh, and cooperate with this she says yes let it be done to me according to your word behold the servant of the lord she says the angel that the angel is going to the angel showing up at, at all sorts of things doing things releasing peter from prison all of these these things angels uh, throughout the scriptures uh, that as messengers and uh, conveyors of god's will but also protectors, such as the in Toba, in the book of Tobin, uh, the archangel Raphael protecting Tobias, uh, and, and Jesus talking about the guardian angels of, of children that behold the face of God always, the little ones. An angel wrote Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, that was Pope Benedict, is so to speak the personal thought with which God is turned towards me. So I have this message. At the same time the angels are turned completely towards their creator. So you know, unlike, you know, if I if you sent me out with a message to go off, you know, go off to pick up uh, our pizza or something like that, and I go off, well, I'm separated, I'm I'm out. So I'm not in your presence, really. But an angel is like an angel is constantly beholding the presence of God. And in Doctor Faustus by Marlowe, the the uh, Doctor Faustus asks, he who sells his soul to the devil, and he asks the, the is it Mephistopheles? Uh, well, you must you know to get a reprieve out to get out of hell from this. And he said, oh no, once you've seen God, everything's hell. Once you're Oh, uh, you've withdrawn from that presence. So angels, the good angels, that is, never are outside the presence of God. So they're not restricted by time and space as we are, because they're not chemical beings. They're whatever the processes there are for them. They're they're very different from ours. So that's why their decisions are are permanent decisions. For good or ill. They burn with love for him and serve him day and night. Because they don't really have day and night in a way. But their song of praise is never ending. Again, that's an image of the song. And, and it's repeated. They keep repeating people. So, so there are some people say, oh, repetitive prayer is, is not prayer at all. Well, they better get used to it. Because that's what the angels are doing. Holy, holy, holy. Repeating. They're singing all these songs over and over again in heaven, that image. Well, uh, re repetitive prayer can be very, very helpful. In sacred scripture, the angels who have fallen away from God are called devils or demons. 
And can we interact with angels? Uh, question 55. Yes, we can call on angels for help and ask them to intercede with God. So they're in this, this communion. So we ask angels, ask your guardian angel to pray for you. Ask your guardian angel to help you. Pope Saint John the Twenty Third, when he was a diplomat, used to send his guardian angel to the guardian angel of the person that he was negotiating with, so that he tried to convince see if you know you can you can get something to work out there. So they pray with us in this 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 connection of the communion of saints, as as we all do. So it's always good to cultivate prayer partner relationships with other people. Ask people to pray for you. Ask people, uh, I'll pray, tell people I'll pray for you, whether they want it or not. Uh, pray for them. But also, especially in this, the, the saints and angels, the saints in heaven and angels, the, those who've gone before us uh, to pray, pray for us. And the, the angels in a special way with, as we're told, behold the face of God night and day. Every person receives from God a guardian angel. It is good and sensible to pray to one's guardian angel. Praying here, of course, doesn't mean adoring, which some people think it means. Pray just means ask. It, it, the, the early modern English, prithi, uh, pray, why are you doing this to me? I ask. That, that's what it was. So we ask people to talk to God for us and with us because it's, it's, we're always connected. We're, if uh, the people who are praying now, I'm connected with their prayer, even though I don't know about them or anything like that. I'm connected with their prayer and I'm praying their prayer with them as a member of the body of Christ. Of course, just prayers. If people are praying for that, you know, I would be, uh, uh, you know, chopped up or something like that, that, or if a prayer given in hatred or all that. But even so, even then, there was a connection. Because uh, the, because uh, God hears prayers the way they're really given, he, what, what's coming out from them. He can't pull the wool over God's eyes in any of these things. So it's good and sensible to pray to one's guardian angel to ask prayer for oneself and for others. Angels can also make themselves noticeable in the lives of Christians, for example, as bearers of a message or as helpful guides. Our faith has nothing to do with the false angels of New Age spirituality and other forms of esotericism. So that's that. Or even more so with demons, who are angels. So there we are. Well, God bless you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Alleluia. And let's wave. Wave back. Timothy Mills. Hi there in California. California, as we say out here. Father Paul Ring. Christ is risen. Barbara Blackler Benbury, Christ is risen. Terry Coakley, Christ is risen. Father Jeremy St. Martin, Christ is risen. Mike Butts, Christ is risen. Well, have a wonderful day, and Christ is risen. Live in that power of the resurrection. Alleluia. Bye now.